So good afternoon and welcome back. So today we get to talk about a new plant family that it has some important value for people and it has played uh, another major role in the history of humankind. Uh, so we have uh, some of the lorikeets here, which are from Australia, that are going to be one of the main pollinators for some members of this family in the native habitat, which is Australia. And so we get to talk about the myrtle uh, family, myrtaceae, that in, uh, encompasses a lot of other plant groups like eucalyptus and uh, guavas as a fruit. So we'll talk about those a little bit later. So the Myrtle family, Myrtaceae, Myrtle family, Eucalyptus family, there are other plant, common uh, plant uh, family names that are out there. And uh, we can see that it has predominantly a distribution in the Southern hemisphere. But what's most important is that Australia is going to be a major continent for members of the myrtle family. They are going to be one of the most predominant plant family. Uh, and uh, uh, along with it is going to be uh, the protea, uh, proteaceae or the proteas that are going to be the second one, or both of them are going to compete for whom is going to be the most dominant individual. And so what happened when the continents were together and uh, they began to split, uh, a member of the family, an ancestor of the family, uh, stayed in Australia. And as Australia moved away from the other continents, it went into different climatic changes. And when it finally got into the dry habitat that is currently in Australia, that allowed for the members of the Myrtle family to really diversify and they have become the dominant, dominant members of the plant family in Australia and also in South Africa, but we'll talk about the Protea in a later time. So we got 131 genera. We're gonna look at some of the more common ones that you may encounter in uh, the gardens out here and 4,600, uh, plus species, and we're not going to see all of them. And so here is our type specimen, which is going to be the myrtle, uh, myrtles communis, uh, showing us a typical flower for the plant family. So in this case, it's going to be white. There's going to be many colors depending on the pollination. And so when we look at the myrtle flower, uh, we're going to find several things. We're going to find the buds. Uh, that are going to have the petals that are going to be covering the interiors. And then we're going to have the sepals. In a member of the plant, uh, this plant family, this becomes really important as a spice. And uh, again, the importance of uh, some of these members in human history in the spice world or the spice trade, going to uh, the spice route to get the spices from Asia into Europe. Uh, and so we have the flower bud that is going to be uh, have sepals and petals, and those will open into, here we have the petals, uh, and then we have a flower that is going to have a lot of stamens, uh, the stamens that are going to be made up of uh, the anther and the filament. So what's going to be the showy portion of most of these mem uh, members of this family are going to be the stamens. Sometimes the petals may be completely gone, Sometimes they're going to be early deciduous, which means that plant is going to drop them because it doesn't really have any value to them. And so keep that in mind. There's going to be many, many stamens, and uh, the stamens will be showy for these uh, flowers. And then somewhere in the middle, sometimes a little bit cryptic, uh, same color as the stamen, is going to be the stigma that is going to give us the, also the attached to the style that will lead to the ovary, that will then give us the fruit uh, for members of this family. And so here we have the beginning of the fruit. So below the flower parts that are no longer visible here, we only have the sepals that remain, uh, the remnants of the stigma in the style. And now we have the ovary that begins to swell, begins to grow into that fruit. Uh, and uh, here's uh, where we have some of those uh, important flower components. Uh, and uh, here we have a mature fruit for the myrtle. Uh, 
that has still kept those uh, remnants of uh, the flower parts and some of them at different stages. This one now turning a dark purple color uh, to signify that it is ready to be eaten. And so when we look at another uh, member of this family, this is uh, the old name would be Callistemum, the bottle brush now under Melaleuca. And so we have here a dense flower cluster or flower spike. Uh, so the flower, uh, flowers giving very close together, uh, giving that uh, bottle brush appearance. And so here we have the buds with the very small sepals and also very tiny petals. Uh, but when we the flowers are open and we see them, we're gonna see that they are gonna be bright colored stamens. And that's gonna be the showy part. You can even see the stigma right here that's gonna be a little bit bigger and maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but we see exactly the same makeup of the myrtle because they come from the similar ancestors. So the flower the components are gonna be pretty much the same. And so here we have the flowers as they're opening. So they will begin to open from the top and then they'll gradually all open. And we can see that the stigma is gonna come out first, perhaps to ensure that there is gonna be a, the pollen from a different plants so that it can bring diversity to the seeds. And we can see the stamens as they are beginning to unfurl or unroll uh, on some of those buds and uh, when the sepals open. Uh, and uh, here is the entire flower. So we have the sepals uh, here that will fall off very easily. Uh, we have the stigma and the style in the center, and then we have an assortment of numerous uh, anthers and or stamens uh, made up of the anther and the filaments. And so the plants had changed the color because they have now adapted to a different pollinator and that's why they're gonna be bright red. And for members of this family that may have come or that may come from a dry uh, climate, uh, the fruit is gonna be a capsule. It's gonna be a dry, it's not gonna be edible, and inside uh, their seeds are gonna be protected until they mature, then uh, the fruit will open and release the seeds. And here with, uh, uh, the capsule, the dry woody capsule, we can see the remnants of the sepals uh, that still remain. And so pollination is going to be primarily through a lot of these lorikeets, which are going to be the parrots in Australia. Uh, bird pollination, hummingbird pollination, or other birds in uh, South Africa are going to be the main members for the red ones. However, there are a lot of marsupials as some of these plants evolve with the marsupials in Australia, uh, there are gonna be marsupials that are also gonna be very important in pollination. So this is where we're now getting some of the higher animals where people may not assume they're pollinated, but in fact they are. And uh, there's also the insects, uh, the insects like the European honeybee, that would be the rightful pollinator for the European myrtle as we see here. So we see a myrtle with a nice landing platform for the insects. We see very bright, colorful flower clusters for the birds. And then we might see some other flowers that may be hidden because the plant wants to protect the marsupial, the pollinator from being eaten by some predators. And so here we have just a few of the more common members that you may come across. I uh, mentioned before, this is Callistemum, but it's now Melaleuca. The genetic work is changing the plants into different groups. So I guess it has been given uh, the name uh, Melaleuca now. Uh, here they are in the Australian section in Adelaide County Arboretum. And uh, here we have the pollen. Another very important thing that you need to be aware of is that the pollen for members of this family is gonna be somewhat crystal shaped or somewhat have some kind of jagged edges. And that is gonna be very important for you to be aware of because you may know people who have allergies to pollen. And so members of this family are gonna be really bad about giving people hay fevers and allergy fevers. And so if you know that somebody on a yearly basis is having problems with severe allergic reactions or allergy problems, you might wanna check around because 
most likely there will be a member of this plant family that will release copious amount of pollen into the air. And that is gonna be the culprit, the pollen that's in the air that is gonna be in close proximity, perhaps to the bedroom, to the window where the person with the allergy may live uh, or sleep. And so it's constantly getting bombarded uh, by this pollen. And yes, uh, those allergies could be really bad. So be aware, allergic reaction to the pollen is gonna be something that may come about, may come across from these members of the family. And here's one of the better trees uh, that we have in uh, Southern California, here's in, in Long Beach, uh, uh, the weeping bottle brush, or some of the smaller selections, uh, the little John, uh, that is used as a regular shrub. Uh, and uh, it's a dwarf individual, and so the flower clusters are also going to be much, much more closer together and compressed. Uh, what's also very important is for you to understand that having a lot of stamens on a flower is not just something that is unique to the myrtles. So we have here two different family groups. Uh, on the left, we have the myrtaceae, the myrtle, uh, and on the right, we have the bean or the fabaceae. Both families are going to have members that came up or evolved with similar pollinator, perhaps a bird. And so they have evolved a very similar mechanism for pollination. And so we do have on the fabaceae or on the bean family, uh, a tree by the name of Albicia. A mimosa tree that also has a lot of the stamens that are going to be the showy component. Now, in this case, it's going to be a flower cluster with many flowers, kind of similar to the uh, to this uh, bottle brush. Uh, but they're going to be completely different plants. The fruit will be different. So just be aware uh, when you're going to be out there looking at plants. Don't just assume that having a lot of stamens as being the showy portion of the flower is gonna be a characteristic that is unique to the myrtles or the myrtaceae. Uh, and then we have eucalyptus or perhaps now corymbia, uh, which is the new name for this uh, red flowering gum. Uh, the name gum for eucalyptus is just an Australian name because of the oils uh, and or the sap that comes from this plant. And so we have a nice display during the summer uh, for the eucalyptus. And eucalyptus means well covered. So what's gonna happen, you can see it on the flower, but that there's gonna be a cap, a cap that is going to be protecting and it's gonna well co or cover very well the reproductive structures. And when the flowers are mature, the caps will fall off completely. Uh, and uh, now you're gonna have the stamens that will come out and then you have the stigma right in the center. And so here's a white form of uh, that red flowering eucalyptus, uh, just to show you the dense uh, number of stamens. And you have the nectaries or you have uh, some kind of floral tube here where the plant will have a lot of nectar. This is gonna be bird pollinated in nature and so the birds will require a lot more nectar than an insect. And so you're gonna have this somewhat deep nectaries to hold a lot of nectar, or sometimes those marsupials uh, can also climb the tree and they'll pollinate them. Uh, and here's a, a different one, a pink uh, one, uh, eucalyptus, and you can also see uh, some of the fruits that are gonna be beginning to form, uh, but all the pink is gonna be the stamens. And once again, you can see the cap, uh, in this case, the cap has a point to it. And uh, as the flowers mature and begin to open, they are pushing the cap off. And so you can see the process of some of the eucalyptus opening the flowers uh, from that. And then you have a dry fruit, a capsule uh, here showing uh, because coming from dry climate, if it had a fleshy fruit, it could probably not survive the dry heat or the plant may hold the seeds in place for maybe one or two years until maybe the environment is favorable for them to see, uh, release the seeds or in order for the seeds to be protected so that they can release them at the right amount, at the right time to ensure that they are gonna survive. Uh, and uh, there's the seeds, or oh, sorry, the fruit when uh, it has opened to release the seeds 
Now, here in Southern California, we do have a small problem. Uh, several years ago, there was an introduction of several lerp psyllids that devastated eucalyptus uh, or members of many members of this family uh, and from the landscape. And so here is the lemon scented eucalyptus that is still here. It's still killing some of the plants. Uh, there are no biologic controls, uh, but and it was inevitable that we have lost a very large number of eucalyptus uh, to some of this uh, pest. That would not be a pest in Australia. So they are native to Australia as well, where the eucalyptus are native to. And so when they are brought out of, the eucalyptus were brought out of Australia, the insects follow several years later. The insects did not have a natural biological control or predator. And so they were able to multiply in huge numbers overwhelming the trees and thus killing them. Uh, but we have lost a lot of eucalyptus to them. And so here's uh, the lerp, uh, which is their home. They make it out of the honeydew that they eat and they'll come out. And so here's some of the original eucalyptus. So this is the blue gum and one of the oldest one uh, here planted at Shadow Ranch, which is in Los Angeles, which was the first planting site for uh, the blue gum when it was started to be planted here in California. It was brought over with the purpose of being used for, uh, for the wood to be used in uh, the railway or the railroad as they were building it. It wasn't good for uh, rail or it's not strong enough wood. And so that got later abandoned. And then it was started to get planted for a quick firewood or for other purposes. Uh, but here is, one of the original uh, oldest tree when I had the opportunity to visit. Uh, and there I am for scale. Uh, and uh, in a, a, a month to follow, unfortunately, the wind uh, brought it down. So the original or some of the original blue gums that were planted are no longer with us. Uh, and there's uh, the base of that tree. And then there's going to be some tropical eucalyptus. Most of them will be from dry climate. However, we have some tropical ones that have a very large leaf. So eucalyptus or Corymbia ferrugiana, as the name here, planted uh, by me at the one of the first, uh, not one of the first, the first uh, arboretum in Los Angeles, uh, the Chavez Ravine Arboretum by Dodger Stadium. Uh, and uh, here it is several years later, the tree has now done very well. It's much, much bigger than what you see here. Uh, and uh, I had the chance to also pick the flowers and pick some seeds and photograph the flowers. So I was very happy when that happened. Uh, so we keep trying to look for the new trees because as we lose them, we need to replace them. And uh, anytime we find something different, then we want to plant it. Uh, and there's the fruit for this. Uh, or there's going to be what they refer to as spider gum. Uh, these are not that common, uh, but we have a flower cluster that is going to have very long hooks and it's kind of going to it's going to resemble a spider or spider legs and that's where the name comes from those will eventually fall off because that's only the cap and you can see it here as the flowers are beginning to open and the cap will fall off giving uh, the opportunity for the stamens to come out and be the showy component and they'll live behind a cluster of uh, woody capsules or the woody fruits with a lot of seeds inside. Uh, the eucalyptus are known to have a lot of oils and that's gonna be the lemon fragrance that you're gonna smell when you break the leaves. And they have also proven to be a problem for the fires that we have in Southern California now. So eucalyptus were planted along the hills because it was a nice magical tree that required absolutely no care, no maintenance. And so it is now known that as soon as the fire starts getting close to the base, the tree will ignite. So the oils within the tree will then um, uh, ignite and the entire uh, tree will be engulfed in flame. And so it makes it difficult for the firefighters to control the fire if eucalyptus have been or are planted in the area where the fire is. Not only that, but the oil can also be found on the leaves, which means that leaves that fall to the ground are not going to rot or decompose as easily 
And so they will provide the fuel for some of those fires to continue on. So yes, it was a very good idea, or they thought it was a very good idea to be for the trees to be planted and mass planted many years ago. But as now we are learning that it was not a good idea, and this is not the best tree to have out in the mountains where fires are now a common thing. Uh, and uh, when I went to Brazil, uh, this was not the site that I wanted to see. Uh, but we do have eucalyptus that are being grown commercial. So yes, the forest was taken out from this area and hundreds of eucalyptus have been planted. They grow so quickly that people use them for making paper. Uh, and so here is a eucalyptus forest uh, in Brazil for making paper. So they will cut uh, some of the stems, they will grind them up, make the pulp, uh, make the paper and they'll keep harvesting uh, year after year new stems, new branches. And that's going to be unfortunately uh, a reality that some of the natural forests can be depleted or taken out just because there might be some uh, monetary value for some of these plants. And then we have the rainbow gum or rainbow eucalyptus uh, that will have a very colorful stem. Uh, so often people see it, they want it. It's a large tree, it has beautiful flowers. There's very few around Long Beach. I think there might be three of them uh, total. Uh, so most unlikely if you wanna see a good specimen, you will need to see or visit a botanic garden to see it. Uh, here's uh, Corimbia, uh, Corimbia, uh, the red flowering gum that we mentioned before. Here's uh, some of the stems and the beautiful branches. A very nice tree. I think it should be planted more. And these are the photographs that I showed you before uh, with the red and the white and also the fruits. Uh, and then we have the Brisbane box. And this would be a group of members of this family where now the stamens are partially fused. So there's still many, but instead of being all throughout the flowers as we've seen with eucalyptus and myrtle, now they are partly fused and you can see that they kind of form a petal-like structure. The real petal is behind it, the sepal is on top. Uh, but now we have here a side view of uh, uh, dozens of stamens, partly fused, uh, creating somewhat of a petal-like. Uh, here's the fruit, which is still a dry capsule. And then uh, Tristan Neopsis used to be a uh, Brisbane box as well. Uh, but here is on 7th and Redondo, where we have also the yellow flowers for this individual and uh, the stamens that are partly fused with the petals. Here you can see them at the base, where they are fused and where they came out from, uh, and the fruit behind it with the remnants of uh, the stigma and the style. And so there's the stamens that are partly fused at the base of the petals, uh, and there's the fruits. Uh, for that. And uh, when the fruit opens, there's a split and the air release the seeds. Uh, and then we have Metrosidero. So some of uh, members of this family that happen to go into New Zealand. It is known as New Zealand Christmas tree because apparently during the Christmas season, the holiday seasons, uh, it's when it's flowers in New Zealand in its native habitat. And so that's where it gets its common name. And we see the flower. That is typical of the plant. Or uh, one-sided bottle brush, Calothamnus. Uh, here it is in full flower. So it's also the stamens that are gonna be partly fused. The petals are kind of gone, not really showy. Uh, or Darwinia, named after Charles Darwin, a uh, species that he found in Southwestern Australia and uh, it was named after him later on. Uh, and so we have Darwinia here with several flowers. And if you ever get a chance to go to Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz has a very nice botanic garden that specializes in uh, South uh, Western Australia. And that's where you find the diversity of many uh, more mer members of this family, uh, including this other Darwinia here. Uh, or here, the, you know, Darwinia does mefolia. Uh, and there's the flowers and the plant. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the close-up of the flowers. Uh, and uh, so there's uh, the leaf and the flowers and uh, there's with the stigmas. Uh, and then we have uh, the Geraldton wax flower. Uh, we don't have, we have the fusion of the stamens partly towards the base, 
so they're not all fused together like we saw in uh, Tristanopsis uh, or the Brisbane box. Uh, but here's still a member of this family. So there's some of the selections where the stamens have been turned into petals or petaloid. Uh, so that's where we have some, some that may look like roses. The original species is just gonna have five petals as you see here. And then as you look at some of the diversity of some of those, once again, from UC Santa Cruz, we have several members. Uh, and then here we have Verticordia, uh, which is another uh, more unusual member of this family. Here's uh, with uh, uh, some of the pink flowers and are looking like a bottle brush. Or here's Verticordia micheliana uh, with uh, very unusual flowers. Uh, and leaves, and there's uh, the side view of the flowers with a single uh, stigma, and there's a different view of uh, this flower. Uh, and then uh, Babingtonia, more of an obscure member. I've only seen it in Botanic Garden, but it does merit some attention for it to be introduced into the general horticulture industry. Or Melaleucas, uh, the paper barks here showing you uh, the bark of the stem that is going to be kind of like paper. Uh, you can peel it, but it's not good for the tree. Uh, and so here is the tree bark that is probably a good sunscreen or protects the tree, the stem the, uh, from being sun scalded. And that's why it's kind of uh, white to reflect the heat. Uh, and there's the flowers that look like a bottle brush, but they're white. Uh, and in Long Beach, we have several trees of the prickly melaleuca, not as many of them. Uh, this one in Park Estate being one of the better individual uh, that we have with the nice bark and the leaves. And it is prickly, so the leaves are sharp, so be very careful. And here's the flowers for the tree. Uh, or uh, melaleuca linarifolia, uh, the flax leaf melaleuca, also around Park Estate. And here's when it's full of flowers, so it can be quite a nice sight. Uh, the leaves are not sharp, uh, but you still need to be uh, very careful with them. And so here's the stamens, uh, partly fused uh, for this individual. Or the pink melaleuca, here showing you the small, tiny pom-pom uh, looking flower clusters with the leaves and uh, watch the stamens. Uh, and or melaleuca armillaris, uh, honey myrtle or honey bracelet, as it sometimes refer, uh, with the flowers. Uh, or here's another melaleuca, uh, here's with uh, the flowers. And or different one here, just uh, to show you the diversity. Uh, melaleuca pulchella, the honey myrtle, uh, here showing you the flowers. Uh, or here's kunsia. Uh, bottle, another bottle brush uh, in the members. Uh, and then there's the peppermint willow. So Agones here is uh, one of the oldest trees planted about 30 something years ago in uh, North Long Beach uh, with a very nice bark and uh, very nice leaves and flowers. Uh, so these are becoming my more popular. And uh, Taxandria, uh, very obscure member. I have not seen or found many plants out there. So if you know, let me know. <clears throat> but more popular is gonna be the tea tree. So yes, members of this family will have oils and the oils can be extracted uh, into the tea, uh, uh, tea oils that is used for treating wounds or inflammations or for other medicinal purposes. So, <clears throat> The tea trees, uh, different colorful flowers that we see right here. <clears throat> here being used as a patio tree or standard tree uh, in the landscape and uh, with the flowers. Uh, or here's uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, a very large specimen that was in full flower when I was there visiting and showing you the flowers. And or here at Park Estate, we have uh, another tea, tea tree, Leptospermum levigatum, also quite old, uh, but it has <clears throat> a very nice growth pattern on the stems. <coughs> Excuse me. So very nice in the landscape, and there's the flowers for 
is in the video and including the fruits. Uh, and there's a few more throughout Long Beach. Uh, or if we now become, go into South America, uh, the member of uh, that remain in South America, uh, then uh, evolve into uh, different types of tropical plants, including the guava. Uh, the guava, which uh, is a very popular fruit. And we have the flower uh, with the sepals and the petals that looks exactly like the other members. And obviously now we have a plant that is no longer from a dry climate, and that's why it could afford to have a much, much bigger fruit. And or also uh, it evolved with different animals. So now the fruit is gonna be used by the plant to attract uh, perhaps some larger animals like monkeys or big birds from the South America that are gonna disperse the seed. And so we have on one side, the remnants of the sepals and all the stamens, uh, the flower components. Uh, so we have there, we're still persisting on the mature fruit. And when you cut it in half, now you have the different components, different uh, segments with lots of seeds, but now you have a pulp that is edible that you can eat. Uh, and then we have the pineapple guava, also from South America. And uh, here's uh, the flowers, and typical of the plant, even uh, the flower buds here. And then uh, here's uh, as the fruit is maturing, you still have the remnants of the sepals. Uh, and when it's uh, getting ready to mature, you have a fruit that's also going to be swollen, very large. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the inside that it's also edible. Perhaps not the best photograph, but it's you can see. Uh, and there's going to be different types of guavas. Some of them are going to be small, like the strawberry guava that we see here, uh, which has very nice sweet fruit or the loemen guava that is also available, that is also very good. And those can be used as an informal hedge. They are being used at Rancho Los Cerritos as an informal hedge for their uh, orchard. And so you have an edible landscape, an orchard with a hedge that separates from the public so they don't cross through. Uh, and it's gonna give you some fruit, some guavas, that you can then eat or make them into jams and jellies. Uh, so here's uh, the tree by itself or a small tree or a hedge. Or we have a rajana, Sidium sarterianum, that it has become a lot more popular. Uh, this is now from uh, Mexico, so North America. So we have a very tiny guava, sometimes uh, known as guayabilla in certain countries, or a rajan in Mexico or other names would follow. So the fruit is a little bit tart, a little bit sweet, uh, and it's sought after by people because they have eaten it when they were little, and it has a very nice flavor to it. Uh, so there's for scale. Uh, or we have the jaboricaba, which uh, you may see it in uh, Instagram because it, it has the ability or it has the characteristic of being cauliflower -y. and cauliflower -y means that the flowers and the fruits are produced out of the stem not out of the tips of the branches as with other plants and so it is not uncommon they refer to it as grape tree grape tree because the fruit are going to look like grapes uh, so here it is a very big individual growing out of uh, the Fullerton Arboretum and uh, here's uh, when the fruits are maturing. You can see why they're called grapes. And uh, there they are. As they mature, so when they're dark, dark purple, uh, you can eat them. They're gonna be soft. They're gonna be a little bit tart. Uh, some of the selections may have an aftertaste to it, but if you never had them, you should give them a try and judge for yourself. And there's a fruit. Uh, and then we have different types of Eugenia. Uh, this one being Eugenia uniflora which is known as a Suriname cherry, uh, that it's also edible. It's also common to grow around here as a backyard fruit. Uh, it's, it also has an aftertaste, uh, but there are now very good selections that I have that are quite pleasant. Uh, and then we have the common Australian uh, brush cherry uh, here being grown as a tree because it can do that. 
And uh, the fruits are edible, but this is probably one of the biggest misnomers where most children have been told that this is, was poisonous by their parents because they don't want them to just eat whatever is growing out there. And so most people still assume that it's poison, but it is not. It is not bad if you let it mature. Uh, or we have the wax apple here growing in Signal Hill that it it's gives a very big fruit. It's, uh, here's the flowers uh, for it. Uh, and uh, here's the fruit, uh, and there's when you open it in half. It's kind of airy. It does have a interesting flavor. Uh, it's not the best in the world, but if you've never had it, uh, you might want to consider trying it. Uh, or here's a Java uh, plum. Uh, so here going uh, by Magnolia and PCH. Uh, here's uh, one of the largest trees that was planted about 40 years ago. And it has become a lot more popular uh, because the fruits are a little bit astringent. Uh, and so it has been now linked to traditional medicinal uses for treating uh, diabetes. And so you may see it in uh, growing throughout the neighborhood because people will plant it to eat the fruit for treating diabetes and also the leaves can be used as well. And it's offered in the market. So if you go on some of the markets along Anaheim Avenue here in Long Beach, you during the right season, you may see it for sale. Uh, and here's the leaves that are also being sold uh, either for soups or for medicinal purposes. Uh, and uh, here is uh, a different one growing out of the, uh, this one is uh, San Diego Botanic Garden, Quail Botanic Garden. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the fruit for that one. And I don't think I got the name for that. Oh, or the roast apple here growing at Rancho Los Cerritos, uh, native to Asia, and now has become, unfortunately, unwanted plant in many South American tropical countries. So there's uh, uh, the flower uh, and there's the beginning of the fruit. And here's the fruit when it's mature and the remnants of the sepals and the stigma style. Uh, and uh, when the fruit is ripened, it'll have just one very large seed, sometimes two. So it is the uh, rind or the outside that has a rose water fl flavor like. Uh, it's not bad, but there's not a lot to eat. Or the Chilean guava, uh, another one that is becoming a lot more popular now, here being used in the landscape at Cal Poly Pomona, not, not Poly Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, with the flowers and the small leaves and a very tiny guava-like fruit. Very tiny, very sweet, very good, but it's just very small. So you will need to definitely get a handful in order for you to really appreciate it. Or we have cloves, uh, Cicigium aromaticum, which is a very important spice. And so when you're looking at the cloves, it's nothing more than the flower buds. So they do not allow the flowers to open. And so it is the base of the flower uh, with the ovary. And you have those cloves flower buds or the petals and sepals that were never allowed to open. And so cloves is nothing more than the flower buds of uh, Cicillum aromaticum, which is the cloves. And these were very important plants, very important spice. And these were some of the ones along with ginger and a bunch of other and nutmeg that people travel to the spice islands, which is Indonesia or the east to bring some of this spices back to Europe that eventually led to Christopher Columbus uh, looking for a different route and accidentally coming to America and the rest is history. So the spices that were produced by many of these plants were very valuable. Uh, so here's cloves uh, and there's the cloves showing you the remnants of the sepals and the petals. Uh, and then there's pimenta or allspice that's also another member of this plant. And obviously those would be the fruit and those are sold on the market. And so with that, the importance of this plant group as either fruit, as either ornamentals, as either a spice, uh, and the importance to birds, I will end today. So take care and have a good day.